Hi OTs, my name is Stephanie. I'm the founder of PASA OT. Many members have expressed interest that they're having a hard time understanding sensory integration. This video will explain not only sensory processing disorders, but as well as the treatment to help these patients. I would like to show you my two children, Audrey and Dylan, who are six and four years old. What's interesting about my children is that my daughter, who is six, has a hard time with tactile senses. She doesn't like things that have tags on them, that are wooly and scratchy. She's very sensitive to clothing, even if it's beautiful and it's cute and it's sparkly. My son, on the other hand, has more of a difficulty with proprioception. He likes those bear hugs. He likes to roll around. He likes those deep pressured swings. Um, so it's really interesting not only being a mother as well as an occupational therapist. So as we go through this, I want you to remember that the harder the victory, the sweeter the reward. So let's get into it. The main points of sensory integration is that one, the individual's interaction with the environment influences development of the brain. Two, the nervous system is plastic and so it is able to change. Three, sensory motor experiences affect the brain's plasticity and four, Sensory motor development is a part of learning. Today I'm going to discuss sensory input, sensory processing disorders, standardized sensory evaluations, occupational therapy treatment for sensory processing disorders, adaptations for sensory sensitivity or sensory modulation problems, and collaboration with teachers, paraprofessionals, caregivers. We will also be going over test questions, so I'll help you break them down and help you understand the correct answer, especially when two answer choices seem correct. So in regards to sensory input, there are seven different types of input. Visual, which is sight. Auditory, which is sound. Tactile, which is touch. Olfactory, which is smell. Gustatory, which is taste. Vestibular, which is balance. And proprioception, position in space. And that's the one that most OTs may have a harder time with. So I'll make sure to go over that one in more detail. So in regards to vision, a lot of times um, kids like things that are really visually stimulating, um, like fireworks, pinwheels, scanning things, things that have lights to them. See in this photo, this child is really stimulated by this pinwheel that is spinning around in circles. So a description might be, where the brain is looking at this visual stimuli through their eyes and input is affected by levels of light, whether objects are standing still or moving. So something that is visually stimulating and interactive. So in regards to auditory stimuli, as you can see in this photo, this teenager is listening to music through her headphones. So something um, musically stimulating, it could be a toddler babbling, it could be a conversation, it could be someone's favorite music piece, um, especially if they have a traumatic brain injury and you want to get them to um, think about things again. Anything that is um, stimulating to the ears. So input that enters the brain through auditory structures of the ear and input is affected by volume if it's loud or quiet and the quality of it. Next is tactile, which is touch. As you can see in this photo, this little girl is cuddling these two adorable kittens. And also, if you touch something slimy, like slime or squishy, that really feels good to the, the hands and the fingers. So the idea for tactile is that people get input through the small nerve endings under the skin. They get different feelings from texture, consistency, and temperature, depending on if it's hot or it's cold. Next is smell. So olfactory and smell. So think of the smell of a factory or maybe a chocolate factory. So the chocolate factory smells really good. So olfactory and chocolate factory. So that could also be where a child is smelling the flowers, they're smelling aromas, you're working with a Rancho Los Amigos patient and giving them cinnamon to help awaken their senses, or you're working with someone who has strong anxiety, you may be giving them essential oils of lavender to calm down and relax. Anytime someone is smelling something, input goes through the nasal cavity and then to the brain. Gustatory and taste. So think of gum. Gustatory gum. Gum tastes really good, especially like the mint kind. That's the one I like. 
An example is a child licking that chocolate vanilla ice cream. Mmm, that smells and tastes really good. So that taste of it. Or the taste of sour candy can increase the level of alertness. Or you may be giving someone um, taste of chicken and waffles to help spark a memory. Um, someone who has a hard time memorizing something after a coma. So anytime you're using taste or into the um, on the tongue to produce taste buds and to enter the brain that way. Next is vestibular and balance. Think of going to space on a vest. So you're blasting through space and you're swinging high in the sky in all different direction. You may be swinging, you may be turning the teacups at Disneyland, you might be jumping, you might be going on your scooter, you might be going down black diamonds in the snow. However it is where the brain is structuring in the inner ear and you're moving in all different directions and you have to cry, try to create balance. The next is proprioception, which is your position in space. Propio, position. Proprioception, position. So that idea is where your brain is stretching those receptors in your muscles, your ligaments, and your joints. So this might be a yoga girl doing crow pose, or they're doing a handstand and they're stretching all the way up to the sky. Or this little kid is pushing their grandmother down the street on a little scooter. So anytime you're pushing, you're pulling, you're stretching, you're lengthening, that's proprioception. Next is sensory processing disorders. Sensory processing disorders is when a patient is having a hard time processing sensory information from those seven sensory inputs that I just discussed. So let's first go over sensory modulation disorder. So this is when a patient may be having difficulty adjusting their nervous system to changes in sensory input. So it could be frequency, how long it is, if it's short or too lengthy of an activity, the intensity of it, duration, complexity, or even if it's a new activity, they've never done this before. So this may result in under or even over responsiveness to sensory input. An OT is working with a six-year-old child who chews his shirt and his shirt nonstop and is resistant to other chewables such as chew tubes or crunchy snacks. The child's parents are asked for suggestions on ways to stop this behavior, stating that they are concerned regarding the condition of the child's teeth. What sensory strategy would be best to incorporate first? So when you're reading a question like this, we really want to focus on what are the main points to the question. Well, we know we want to focus on a sensory strategy first. What are we going to do first with this patient? The patient is six years old and they're chewing their shirt nonstop. So we're looking for another sensory strategy. So would it be A, teach alternative calming strategies, B, ask the parents about the child's nutrition, C, change the texture of the shirt the child wears, or D, provide the child with a knotted bandana to wear and chew. Well, the answer is A, teach alternative calming strategies because the parents are concerned over the child's teeth. The OT would not want to present an alternative object for chewing since the chewing behavior usually comes from a desire for proprioceptive input. The OT could teach the parents alternative strategies to provide deep pressure or proprioceptive input to the child, such as rolling in a heavy blanket, carrying heavy items while helping around the house, or even jumping on a trampoline. Sarah is a six-year-old girl who displays sensory-seeking behavior, including running everywhere, climbing on the furniture, and jumping off tables and countertops. So what is Sarah's behavior an example of? So she, we know that this girl is sensory-seeking. She's seeking behavior um, of running and climbing and jumping. So she's very aroused. She needs to get that going. So is it sensory-based motor disorder? Is it sensory discrimination disorder? Is it active engagement or even sensory modulation disorder? The answer is sensory modulation disorder. Sensory seeking is a sign that this child is under-responsive to sensory stimuli and is really craving um, some more sensory. 
This is a taste of our full 27 minute video, which is only available when you sign up to our Pass the OT web course. Once you purchase a subscription to our program, you will have unlimited access to all our learning material, including this very informative video, which gives you an in-depth look at Sentry integration. Including in the video information is on Sentry processing disorder, standardized Sentry evaluations, occupational therapy treatment for Sentry processing disorders, adaptations for Sentry sensitivity or Sentry modulation problems, importance of collaboration with teachers, paraprofessionals, and caregivers, and more question breakdowns.